All right, ladies and gentlemen, and <clears throat> whatever else in between. We are back for episode 109 here in the challenge series. Hopefully, the relative quiet of the house holds up for an hour and a half, as it's often one to not do. Uh, certainly, a couple of weird sights in this episode to be seen. Um, one or two scary ones. One or two cool ones. And <clears throat> a lot of neutral colored sports cars. Like, seriously, you could make a you could make an aesthetic out of that. Um, but for starters, Interlagos hosts a 715 category race, and we shall proceed with no further delays. And the race is green. <clears> Throat's <throat> still a little awkward. Two and a half weeks later. I don't fully understand it. Uh, but what I do understand is that we are on board with Thomas O'Reilly in that very familiar Cobra. Very familiar with Oversteer, which is probably specifying. Um, and this is a sort of the sort of circuit that I imagine a Cobra wouldn't do too great at, <clears throat> because it heavily revolves around low-speed acceleration. Something that a car like Hikari's R34 would probably be really good at. But something like a Cobra, with how finicky this thing can be when you apply the throttle, I can't understand how Thomas does it. Everybody files through the <clears throat> uh, basically three and a half executive parapins. Uh, one's technique through here makes or breaks the fast racer. We already see a little bit of that oversteer coming from O'Reilly's Cobra, heading between the second and third hairpins. Or first and second hairpins, I mean. This is the third hairpin. It is not as long as the other two, but it is still, to me, a hairpin. You can see this based off of the telemetry. He's not on the throttle too much, because he knows what to expect the second he gets on. And then, of course, we get the prerequisite stream of cars heading into the pit lane because of lap one contact, although it's only four, so that's better than we normally do in that regard. Down the inside of his, uh, well, his team's co-owner, Tuco de Santos, in the first of two new cars for this race. Tuco has a Mercedes C63. And... <clears throat> I don't know why this looks weird to me. I don't know, it just does. And while we're on the subject, the other... Uh, new car for the race, Nick Ambrose, with a black and white Jaguar F-Type, which he's sliding around a little bit in. Uh, Cameron Walker leads the way, a driver who's certainly seen Interlagos many a time in his F1 league racing career. <laughs> um, that's, that's good in-game talk, so... How much of a bearing does that have on the Challenge Series? Uh, I'll let you be the judge. O'Reilly creeping up into 6th place. <clears throat> Coming up now behind myself and a train of two other cars. He's forced to almost slam the brakes to avoid rear-ending uh, Fernando Fedanzi, and that causes him to almost completely lose control. Somehow, by by the power of, uh, I don't know what, he does not crash and ends up on the podium spots with just shy of three whole laps remaining. Next is Derek De La Cruz in that C6 Corvette, and there's where the acceleration of this car can shine on this track's two long straightaways. The Cobra is nigh unmatched. Uh, he will next find a match in the race leader. 
of uh, the R8 of Walker. A car that I'm also really not surprised is doing so well here, considering it'll have plenty of traction on corner exits for being all-wheel drive and mid-engine. But it also gets absolutely embarrassed around the outside. No amount of four-wheel drive can fix that one. Oh my god, that was absolutely career-ending. Not really, but... You gotta be a little bit embarrassing to be overtaken like that by a car that's almost 60 years old. As we hit on to the next lap, Fernando Fidanzi is going to make his way into the podium spots, his MC20 ahead of the Corvette. And a pretty textbook overtake at turn one for the Maserati racer, racer driver. I definitely did not appreciate that kind of moving in the braking that uh, Ambrose did. I definitely had the pass on him lined up, and he's just like, now what if I just turned in like 10 minutes early? And he brake tests me like I'm the problem. I... If this were unhinged, I swear. If this were unhinged. I even gave him a little tap. I was not having that. I'm not one to do that very often, but I gave him the bumper. I'm sure Tyler's running back here in 15th, and he's probably smiling at that one. He's probably pretty proud of that move, honestly. <laughs> the final lap has just begun. Thomas still has a pretty solid lead, about three seconds back to Cam Walker. Two and a half, actually. Uh, getting, you know, just has to hold on to it. it makes it sound, and make it sound so simple, but honestly, that's probably the easier part. The harder part is actually Maintaining the lead is not too hard. Maintaining control of the car is paramount. Very difficult to do in this Cobra, at least so I'm, I, 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 I act like I've driven these cars. I haven't. I just can guess based on the fact that it's a 1960s Roadster with a ton of body roll, some, like, I don't even know how much horsepower, like, 6, 10? or something. No front arrow, no, like, ground effects or anything. Basically just an overpowered as fuck go-kart with a roll, with a, uh, a roll hoop, some fancy chrome accents, and a driver who's old enough to be my uncle. But somehow, the Scotsman makes it work for the most part. We'll head through the final little kinks here at Interlagos. He's getting a little sideways even on these, which is very telling of just the nature of this Cobra. Up to the line, victory for Thomas O'Reilly. And Ken Walker was sweating a little bit. Fernando Fidanzi almost got him at the start-finish stripe. Look, De La Cruz fourth, me fifth. Ambrose sixth with his first race at, in the F-Type, but the debut did not go so well for his co-owner, Tuco De Santos, bringing home a mere 18th position. So, basic math dictates he probably took damage during the race at some point. As I think was the case with most of the cars. I think it's probably safe to bet that anybody outside the top 10... Eh, maybe not. I would say probably... I, would, I know Mika got damage. So I believe she was the one... 13th was the highest position for drivers that didn't take damage here. Such as the nature of a track with, like, four heavy braking zones, I guess. Everybody has a different approach. And when that happens, sometimes we approach terminal velocity. But instead, let's just approach race two of the episode. Race two of this episode takes us to Austria in the Red Bull Ring for uh, the 675 class race. And unlike the last round where we only had two new cars we do have a new face or two i would say here i'm actually kind of pumped to see these guys in action again i've met them before anybody who's followed my channel for a while has met them before but they go by a bit of a different name nowadays uh but without much hesitation let's actually get down to the racetrack and see what the the old and new guys are made out of Yeah. 
and we take off from the starting grid here. Let's mention the 675 class here at Red Bull Ring, and you've already seen probably at least one or two of the new cars here. Um, we're on board with Yo Watanabe, the Evo 6. Her four-wheel drive advantages benefiting massively as she's already nearing the top ten. And we're only through a handful, not even a handful, we're through two corners. And into the top ten, it's very crowded here, and people are we're doing well to avoid a massive accident, honestly. Some cars not faring too well. We see Burt's FC with some pretty significant car damage. That'll basically end her day right then and there. We're looking up the upper up, 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 the upper echelons of the running order. It's mostly clean. Juan got whacked pretty hard. Maki with some big damage. One of the new drivers has damage. Actually, two of them. I should get a look at. I should get a look at why uh, some of these cars have damage. Well, here's where it starts. Uh, one of the new guys getting a little bit big for his britches. I don't know what he was thinking there. I really thought he was better than that. And it's a it's a BMW failure fest as uh, Monkey C, Monkey Do, or in this case, Monkey Don't Hit the Brakes, Hanio. Also piles into the back of my mom, which damages that Audi. Continuing the combo. Uh, oh, oh, that wasn't the new guy's fault. Who was, who was to blame? I would like to go down the order, thank you. Maki, seriously. Yeah, Maki just threw her car at the back of Blonde. Her Supra is absolutely destroyed, and that dealt significant damage to one of the other new drivers of the race. One of, one of three that are in this race, but the top half of the field all made it through turn two pretty cleanly. They're all in a tight little pack here with a couple of exceptions. Some light nudging and all that, but it was nothing really major. It all just started with... Uh, one of the two new driver, one of the three new drivers, just sending it way too late <clears throat> at the breaking point and finding the back of an RX-7. First of which being uh, Gunner North in the heavily modified BMW M series, almost unrecognizable from a BMW minus minus the grill. It's like a, it's like it's kind of like Haneo's car, but way faster, like way faster looking, and yet getting overtaken by it nonetheless. Uh, we also have Stuart Duhan in a concept car. The, uh, <clears throat> checking my notes. Where are the notes? Ah, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Zagato Iso Revolta. I don't know what any of that means. It sounds incredibly Italian. And it's also incredibly damaged. The fallout of lap one sends nearly half the field into the pit lane. Seven cars. Uh, Nick Ambrose with another new car on offer today, which I had to look twice. I almost put this down as Noriaki Nakazato. No, it's not. It's just uh, Nick Ambrose with a very similar looking RX-7. Once again, keeping the neutral color patterns going. And then we also have contact between Riel and Kaneshimi. Uh, another new machine for Tuco de Santos, a Mercedes A45. But as we join back with our actual focus driver of the race, Yo Watanabe has already made her way into the podium positions, and we're only halfway through lap two. So, she and Evo are making massive progress. Fast forwarding to the start of lap three, though, and the next action we get is not with Yo, but it's actually with the race leaders. Uh, new guy, Angel Farrell. Has just made a pass for the lead in his C3 Corvette Stingray. A car that we're more than familiar with here in the 675 class. I mean, more than familiar with, it's more like... It's more like Stockholm Syndrome. 
we're starting to love these C3 Corvettes here in this category just because of how badly they kick our asses, it seems like. But yeah, add that to the list. Angel Farrell with his own C3 Corvette, making his debut and making a very strong one. Yo will overtake her Alliance teammate of Ellie. And knowing what I do know is Ellie apparently got damaged. I don't honestly god know how that little contact damaged her car, other than the fact that it was put together by a Porsche. Um, the fact that she did hold Farrell off for two and for basically two, two laps, that's more of a testament to Ellie than it is to Angel. We just get back to present time here. Full disclosure, anybody who knows the seat knows the channel. Angel Farrell used to go by 16 Angels. One of literally the best drivers ever to hold a steering wheel. So, it's no surprise that he's leading the race on debut. And the fact that Ellie and Yo are even staying with him is kind of saying a lot. Because you can just kind of look at the gap between Ellie here in third. And why is the Kaiser, you know, known former test driver for Porsche, same with her daughter right behind her, you know, people that were given official backing by a major motor corporation they can't even hold a candle to these three. Well, they'll be able to pass Ellie because she has damage. Also, go figure, Ellie driving faster than the people who test the car she's driving. But Yo's kind of hanging with Angel at the moment, not super well. Uh, sort of just filling his mirrors, barely. But I mean, like literally everybody else in this race is a field filler. I mean, what is that difference? Six seconds between Yo and Liza? That is... For lap three? That is insanity. And it wouldn't surprise me if Yo is probably pushing this Evo right to its limits just to stay with this guy. I hate to, like, marry Sue this dude, but, like... You had to be there during the events of the University of Iron Time Loop. It didn't even matter what we were up against. Having drivers like 16... Uh, uh, hello? Down the inside goes Watanabe. I didn't think she'd get there that quickly. Uh, doesn't quite work there, but she still keeps his nose in. <coughs> his nose became congested. Yos hung around the outside, inside again, but it's still... Angel comes up big with, the, with defense, and he'll continue to defend into eight. I'm, I don't know how this is happening. I, I, I really hate to try and oversell 16 Angels. I'm going to probably call him that a few times by force of habit. Um, the fact that Yo is making him sweat, I... That's terrifying, especially since I... She's more of a rally girl. You know? She'd rather be driving her Evo 10 at, like, Colorado Springs or something. Uh, no, here she is at Red Bull Ring, heckling a driver who at one point was responsible for pretty much saving all of time itself. The driver with so much skill, as he... I don't... That didn't look very skillful. <clears throat> but he's also probably very confused how some random, like, 18-year-old with the Lancer Evo is running him down. Probably a little confusing. He's using gutter techniques on a racetrack, like, he just took the curb to turn better. And Yo sleeps around the outside anyway, four-wheel drive paying dividends right there. New race leader, Yo Watanabe. I don't, I don't know how she got here. Angel's not completely done yet, he's gonna try and stick his chrome, his chrome bumper there, but, uh, he can't get the Corvette back alongside. Now it's just two more corners to go for that Evo 6 pull off honestly quite the upset uh oh why are your brake lights not oh shit Ugh. that is a brake failure at probably the worst place on the track not the worst place actually turn four would be worse three would be pretty bad too but this is you don't want to brake failure anywhere, not when this track's got four heavy braking zones. And this car had to pick one of them. If it had to fail, it could have failed at six. 
maybe. Five or six, but no. Maybe even the last turn. Uh, there is a Marshall's Post out there. And thank God for that. And also thank God that Barbara wasn't running the race. So, I was, uh, well, because it's Mercury was in this race, there's so many Mercury drivers in it. Uh, I was, therefore, on site. First of all, I about threw up at the sight of this. Second of all, uh, I watched the, <laughs> the, like, the giant big screens they have for spectators <clears throat> to show parts of the track that they can't look at. I looked up at one of them when this happened. I just see Barbara literally full tilt sprinting around the outside of the final turn to get over here. I think it says something when this car went so far out of bounds that the trackside cameras don't actually follow it if I switch out of it right now. Like, if I stay here, yeah, you'll get a view of Yo's absolutely deleted Evo 6, but if I go into cockpit cam view, it, it, it can't find another trackside camera. That's how far away this car just traveled from the racetrack. But, uh, nonetheless, a little bit of suspension bounce, but Angel Farrell is going to head out of the last turn, and he is going to win, but honestly, he probably shouldn't have done. He was not the fastest car on this racetrack, and I think he knows that, and he he probably hates that, and he also probably hates what he just saw. So, he's probably not happy about winning either. Uh, Stephanie Kaiser grabs second place. Kotori will take a podium spot, uh, splitting the two Kaiser uh, fan members down the middle. Uh, not, not a bad debut for uh, Tuco with his A45, but... Mediocre at best for Ambrose, the last of cars that took no damage. Uh, now I guess it's probably the best time to mention the identities of the other two new drivers. Stuart Duhan used to be known as Swoopy Doo. And Gunner North once went by The Governor. With, yes, the fake British accent is important. Because he would always say it that way. When he introduces himself. And we already mentioned Angel Farrell, once known as 16 Angels. And, well, I think Yo's probably going to need an Angel after this one. Or probably needed an Angel because that car is destroyed. And if Barbara weren't hanging around in the uh, back, like, back part of the track, we might have had a bit of a tragedy on our hands. We'll just say that much. And yet, instead of a tragedy, uh, by the following evening, uh, we had the dirt race at Colorado Springs. And wouldn't you know it, the person that we thought just had a fatal crash is actually starting near the front in this race. <laughs> and from what I understand, she had some words from one of the other drivers on the track tonight. Um... I don't know who's, why, I, I can't imagine why for that matter, she, I hadn't had a chance to ask, but, um, maybe the race can give us the answer, I'm not sure. And we are green from Colorado Springs, and, uh, the rear-wheel drive car on the front row made this race race start very interesting. And there is a single new car in this race, and we will get to them momentarily. Ashart struggles for control. Meanwhile, the similarly made but four-wheel drive Lancia Delta of 
Fiona Kodanji. I hate that fact. Why does this entire family insist on freaking amalgamation? Really confusing. Is this, is this Francesca or is this, no, this is Fiona? Um, Yo is clearly not deterred. He's already up in the third, although that's paused. But she did just get doored by a Renault R5, though. And there we do see one of the new cars, in, or the one new car in the race. Uh, Tuco de Santos with an SD205 Celica. I thought, like, I thought the likes of myself and Noir had absolutely no sort of, like, the, like theming or pattern to the cars they choose. Like, a lot of people, they have their, you know, predetermined loyalties. Oh, for instance, the Santos is about to be loyal to the wall. How did he survive that? Other than sort of saving the car off the front of Cotexa, but... You know, a lot, of, a lot of drivers have their predetermined loyalties to a certain brand or type of car, like... Ambrose used to prefer electric cars, but now all of a sudden he's bringing just about everything else. Like Sammy with his Mitsubishis, and Tetsuya with his Subarus. Uh... Nico with Toyotas. Riho with... Gimmicks. And the list goes on. <clears throat> Chica also with Subarus. Yo also with Mitsubishis, if she, if she is, has run down uh, the leading Fadanzi family member with a bit of company from a minivan behind him that is still hanging with the top two, barely. And Ashard is fighting for her life to keep that pickup truck at bay, and it's just about working, somehow. Meanwhile, Nico, our POV driver, is making slower progress up the field. She just had to she tried to get a little bit testy with me just there, as did Logan. They're lucky I'm driving a big truck, they can't just push around, otherwise there'd be a problem, but... Um... I mean, yeah, like, I have no specific theme, although I have my favorite cars. I wreck too many of them to have a consistent thing going. Another tank slapper from Ashart. She's, she's surviving, and that's about all she's doing. And that's uh, that Renault at the moment. The top two, still no tail, nothing's changing up here. Not much anyway. Yo is literally could not be much closer, but you just can't seem to find the opportunity to go for it. Nico looking for fourth place on the truck of Cortexa, gets ahead, slides, slots in between two fellow Toyotas and out drags Katamatsu towards the next set of turns, and now she's already what the hell. <clears throat> nice dramatic camera pan from the drone camera there to reveal that she's already ahead of Watanabe and looking at the leader of that Delta right now. You can try the outside of, of them though, which can be pretty difficult to achieve, and yeah, that effort will actually just allow Watanabe to try and get back to second, but it might not work. They nearly collide, but well, they don't. <laughs> the more you know, they um, they co they almost collided, but they didn't collide. No shit. Uh, powering around the outside here, though, for the better and landing off one of the jumps gives Nico Yazawa the race lead at basically the halfway mark. That was a jump scare and a half for no reason. GR Yaris jump scare. And now she'll just uh, she'll just get to work. And try to extend that lead or at least not lose it. That's the main goal, I suppose. A handful of moments later, that I mean about half of lap four, and the battle for second is still very close. Uh, Fiona Fadanzi is holding up a bit of a train behind her, and Watanabe is feeling the effects of that as she nearly gets turned by Damien for third. Now, the train also does include Katamatsu, and I was catching this group pretty quickly as well, after getting clear of the mid-pack cars such as the Santos and specifically Ashheart, who, despite being like probably the worst car in the category, or at least one of them, case in point, she was fighting for every position, like every inch of the road. It was 
frankly kind of infuriating. I must be. I must be honest. Yo tried to sneak around the outside there, but instead uh, just lost momentum and failed. Nico enjoying a pretty comfy lead at the moment. Five seconds in hand. Not running the fastest lap to the race, but the person doing that is back in sixth and has a minivan in the way. So I don't really think she has anything to worry about, so long as she keeps that GR Yaris underneath her. As much as it kind of looks like she's trying to lose control of the way that she's driving that thing right now, but I guess I really shouldn't question her methods because she's leading and I'm not. Just two more turns to go for the Yaris driver. Uh, I kind of got a little unkempt in the middle pack, but we'll cover that in a second. Nico out of the last turn. Another statement win for NFR, despite only having, uh, well, her near the front at all. Uh, Fiona Fadanzi hangs on for dear life to grab second, and Damien will steal third from Yo in the closing minutes of the race. That's for how we arrived at that outcome. It's actually started by Yo trying to make a move for P2, but uh, getting pushed wide by Fiona and having to let off. Conceding to second to Fiona allowed Damien to take an easy path to third place. And Katamatsu almost got himself involved as well. Or he probably would have. But then there was a truck behind him that decided that I wanted fourth place. And he had a really bad bounce there. It looked like I hit him. I assure you I didn't. I, uh... Yeah, I look at the rear end cam here. That bounce was just absolutely lethal. There was nothing anybody could hope to do about that. But it is Nico's day, followed by Fiona and then Damien, the ever the opportunistic one here at the Challenge Series, to say the least. That uh, round off the podium finishers from Colorado Springs. Another okay debut from DeSantos, 7th place, and that is the only debut to, be, to speak of in this race. Um, but, yeah, because this, this is the time Ambrose didn't have a new car, he just had his Mustang. But, uh, on to round 3. The, uh, not the track I would have picked for race four of the of the uh, week. However, uh, uh, I didn't pick it. So, <laughs> ultimately speaking, this was uh, Nutrien Tyler's idea to head here for the first time in a while. We are at Bathurst, and this is the 640 class. So, smaller lap count only running three laps because laps here in these cars are almost two and a half minutes long if not longer some cars could or would do 230s or slower so <clears throat> compared to the near disaster of week two and the the chaotic action of races one and three this to me seemed like more of a filler is that maybe a little bit of a metagaming tom but like commentary on it? Uh, probably, but pff, screw it. Filler as it may be, it is underway, and it does bring a handful of new drivers to the ta or rather new cars to the table. Uh, we are on board with Raven Katsuragi and her S2000, 
and I think for the first time in the whole series, she will be racing against her older sister in the same category. But, uh, the bigger stories of the race, the two new vehicles, as Raven is going to be forced into the grass, as, the, as she is three wide with Ilara and with uh, Yazua for 13th place. And at the end of the uh, at the end of the sector, it looks like it might be her with 13th ahead of Nico at the hairpin. No, nope. Nico's going to power on the outside. The super with a better launch off the turn. She isn't the only super in the race either, as. Uh, one of the last new cars that I understand Kenaguchi Racing Team is after, Akira's uh, self-titled Archangel, a little bit edgy I would say, uh, Mark III Supra. As in the background, we just saw Raven take Akira on the inside of Skyline, and she will do the same with John Large, driver who's actually won here on the Invitational Appearances at the Bathurst 24 Hours once. So, not an easy move to make on anybody. And then the new driver of today's race. And probably one of the more eccentric debuts or debuting races we've had in quite a while. Ushiko Kito. I believe I said that right. It might be Ushi or Yushi, but I think it's you it might be I think it's Ushi. Yeah, as I said, an eccentric one. She has a GR Corolla, which is about the only normal part of this person, let me tell you. Uh, she is a VTuber, but she's not just a normal VTuber, she does IRL streams of extreme sports. And auto racing is just the next one on their to-do list. Uh, you could totally find them on twitch.tv slash movement if they were a real person. More metagaming! Come on, brain. Uh, Raven, who already also has uh, streaming setup of her own moves into fifth place on John Casillas and looks towards the top few drivers. Rebecca Briggs is currently leading the way, <clears throat> a fair safe distance away from the Toyota Crown of Fidel, which is currently under threat from the hard charging Super B of Noir, and that's about as easy as it gets. Never mind, late on the braking, Fidel somehow gets that stopped. Is that gonna save him? I can't tell. No, it will not. Noir grabs second. Raven in the background also took fourth away, so she's right here with this little group of cars to make it a three-way battle for second. Well, Rebecca attempts to escape. Not in the context she's used to, though. That's a bold decision there, Raven, around the outside at the top of the hill. Two for the price of one, how did you pull that off? What in God's name was that? And through Skyline, she now only has one more target ahead of her, and that is the 69 Camaro that is currently leading the way. And is currently sliding uncontrollably. <laughs> Should make things easier, I suppose. Conservative on the brakes is the S2000. But that is going to be a huge drive off. And getting in the high revs of, fifth, of fourth gear and into four fifth gear. So <laughs> bring it back up to six once around this curve. Ah, uh, the half. Raven Katsuragi is now leading the race, having embarrassed the Camaro on a straightaway in an S2000. Go figure. Meanwhile, while, while that was going on at the front, we also had this movement from Fidel Fabian, which damaged the back of Noir's Super B. So, I've, I've certainly heard people's opinions on Fidel's racecraft through here. I think she just checked him up there to try and mess with him after that contact as well. All things considered, pretty simple final lap for uh, Raven Katsuragi spite of the fact that she's still pushing the car down the hill for really no reason. This race is as good as hers, and you can tell by the deficit that she's already built ahead of Rebecca Briggs. Yeah. 
I didn't really know she had it in her to just master a circuit like this. But, uh, oh boy does she ever. And now she only has basically three turns to go. Well, at least by my personal account. And, uh, good old Venom Raven will claim victory. Gets a load down for the chase. Maintains traction on exit. Barely. And that's the final turn. And that should just about seal the deal. Raven Katsuragi through the last corner. And that is a straightforward victory if I ever saw one. Rebecca Briggs, second place. Fidel Fabian with a slightly scratched up grill will take home third. <laughs> and desire our friend John Casillas will come home in fourth in that C2 vet. I'm surprised he can keep anything under him at a track like this. A decent debut for Akira's Archangel, placing sixth. You can't say the same for our new blood here, though, as Ushiko comes home with a mere 14th place. And that is in among, just barely ahead of the cars that got damaged during the race, including the winner's own sister, Veronica, who ends up with the mere 18th. Not great from Thrasher's main protagonist. And the roulette race takes us to the good old hallowed grounds of Fuji Speedway. At least they are that way in the challenge series as this is pretty much the series home track uh but yeah it's not the biggest track in japan i think you'd probably say that's suzuka but this is where we make our home so we just you know we live with that and yeah the roulette race had a couple of twists by that i mean well, a couple of new drivers <clears throat> well a new driver and a new car which Look kind of familiar, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just cover that along the way. And we are away for the roulette race to cap off episode 109, and we are on board with the somewhere in this mess of cars, Torque Maddox and his heavily modified Mustang as he slots himself into 10th after just one straightaway due to the increased horsepower of that machine. And he will, well, settle into his spot now in 8th, making pretty quick progress because that is the entire class car. Um, one debuting one new car, we have Tuco de Santos now with a Nissan GTR running the top category with. Not new by any means, but Angel running double duty this, in this week already, having made a start now here at the roulette race. And uh, yeah, that's not confusing at all on the leaderboard for a second there. I oh, know it's still, it's still like that. Yeah, the family tree continues to grow. We now have Kurt Wilde, Travis Wilde, or Kurt's son, and Mark Wilde who's made his debut here at the roulette race in a very ominous-looking SRT-10 Viper. He's very possessive about it. I don't really need his car. I have a Viper of my own, but whatever. Although, based on the way that his car does look, I'm not sure if he's here on recommendation from his own brother or from Torque. Either way, he does join Taro and many others on the Scorchers team. And so, unlike his brother, who has not done that and is keeping completely to his own. Tuco leads the way, which doesn't surprise me as he is in a 750 class car. I believe my dog is barking upstairs, so hopefully the mic isn't picking that up too much. But he is a noisy little idiot, so probably, he probably is. Okay, and then I, now that I think the hair-brained mutt is contained, back to the action. Yeah, you can see the similarities. They, I don't know what went on after, in between Time Loop and Universe Zero, or maybe this is all before that, I don't know. 
I really should ask one of these times. That's kind of my job is to get to know everybody. And if there's this whole Metal Maniac theming, I believe that's what I remember reading somewhere. I remember reading that terminology. And the M's and the double M logo on both Kurt, Kurt, Mark and Torx cars would kind of point to that, as you can see there. Um, but yeah. My dad is just stuck in this mess. Right, he's in a wild sandwich, and Torque is also there. But actually, he outdrag he's out dragged by Torque as well as Mark. Somehow, despite being a class above it, the modified Mustang has so much horsepower that it's able to get away from the Viper a little bit, but then completely missed turn one. Uh, I mean, I guess if it's anything like Thrasher's Mach 40, that thing is pretty heavy, and slowing it down can be difficult. I, I know Thrasher himself has gone through many a brake pad in his car. Wherever the fuck it is. Skipping forward a bit, and now Torque has Kurt Wilde in his sights. Oh, and also a little bit of... No, no damage. But contact. I can only assume if Torque knows Mark, he must know Kurt. He also knew Taro, who knows Kurt. He also knows Kurt, who knows Kurt. It's all connected over there with that weird group of people. And Torque takes second place away from my mother, which gives him the category lead as well. Tuco is some ways up the road in his 750 class DPR. But something tells me Torque might have the pace to get there anyway. It's been a while since we've seen a 715 upset 750s, but we might be looking at that happening again here today. Depending on how he, he gets on when it comes to catching the TTR, which so far seems to be relatively well. Let's see if he keeps that up. He kept that up, and he almost went down the inside at uh, turn 5. I believe that is. I don't, I don't actually know if your number is because ooh, that wrong right hander here at Fuji could be seen as one, but it's got like three apexes. What I do know is that Torque is going to try and use this very sharp corner to get ahead of the DTR, which isn't really where I would have tried to pass it at. I, I, I would think he just played for the straightaway, right? This Mustang has got to have a lot of power. Yeah, sure, this is a DTR and all that, but I think. And I still figure that this thing would be better on a straight. But Torque doesn't seem to feel like waiting. Down the inside at the penultimate corner. Does he clear off of that? No. Tuco remains there. They continue to go too wide. Uh, Torque forcing Tuco to put his new GTR through its paces. And with that smooth move on the outside, he did that on purpose. Torque Maddox is the new race leader with what I would probably estimate to be three laps to go. Oh, you can hear the brakes squealing there. Yikes. Uh, actually, the race might be able to end just before Torque finishes his sixth lap. So this might be two to go, it might be three to go. If we do get to another lap after lap six, it'll not be by much, I can assure you of that. Battle for second is now going on. Kurt Wilde up to the back of Tuco. And while this is the battle for second overall, this is also, perhaps more importantly, the battle for the class lead. And Mark Wilde is present as well, so... Probably that might be the higher stakes than the overall win. So, depending on how you look at it. So Kurt's obviously going to want to get this move done. I mean, no shit, right? It's a race. Obviously, you want to pass your opponents in the race. There's not much else going on up or down the field right now. Mika Harris has a pretty healthy lead over the next car in her category. And by that, I mean, Jesus Christ, she's 13 seconds ahead of Isabel. Maki also, likewise, has a pretty healthy lead uh, in the 640 class with another 15 second lead per name. And Tomas Pazer is leading the 600 class which does have the other new driver. And he's got a nine second lead. And he just passed 
Travis Wild. He's, he's battling a pair of 930s, which are a category above and beast. And Travis Wild is actually two above, so there's really no excuse there. Uh, but yeah, Gemini, or Darius Spirel, as my leaderboard will say, has brought an S13. Finally, I, I've been seeing this car at his shows forever. It's about time that it showed up at a racetrack. This doesn't seem, to be super, doesn't seem to be super fast, though. Admittedly, that doesn't surprise me. I know this thing is a drifter. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, or in the Legion of Doom, or how, how, whatever reference you want to make, uh, as we're on the front stretch, starting what should be the final lap, down the inside, Kurt Wilde, just uh, out of nowhere, caught Tor completely off guard. He was just trying to pass the Santos, and he instead gets two for the price of one, and he will grab the race lead in that McLaren F1. And meanwhile, Mark Wilde looking for third, trying to follow his brother ahead of the GTR. He might just do it, but he is stuck the long way around. Speaking of the long way around, that's how Torque is trying to get back to the lead. And now he'll have the proper line, and he'll just cut ahead at the apex. Hit the apex! And Torque will get back to the lead. He'll have a straightaway to try his darndest to get away from Matt McLaren. And he had better hit the he had better hit the road, but Kurt's not well, he's not able to do anything about it. Tuco's back down the inside of the McLaren. They make contact at the second half of the of the chicane there, but not much contact, all things considered. Gemini is now a lapped car in the way. But it seems like he is able to keep himself uh, not quite out of Mark Wilde's way, but he got out of Kurt and Tuco's and Ports which was probably the most crucial successful leader. Final turn, and now it is just a drag race to the line. Tuco did not get the exit I expected him to receive out of such a slow, a slow speed hairpin, which may have just spelled victory for Torque here from Fuji Speedway. Very close race, though. You know, top three under a blanket. Mark Wilde would have been right with them, but he got blocked by Gemini's S13. Uh, a... a Relatively uncommon upset, the 715 class of Torque Maddox wins over three 750 class cars. Brian Ice, who stole second in class from my mom, is probably feeling a little bit inept. Mika Harris, as mentioned, absolutely crushes the 675 class with their GT40. And Maki, likewise, absolutely stomps the 640 class over Kurara Suzushiro in her Suzuki Swift. 18 seconds difference, by my count. And Tomas Pager definitely wins the 600 category, being the only one to finish lap 6. I think. No. Yes, Neptune did not get a 6th lap. She's just on the 6th lap in her cooldown. Gemini's S13 has not had a great debut at all. Finishing last in class and being lapped by a decent chunk of the field as he finally ends his race. But yeah, Pager definitely won his category since he literally beat Ellie in a car that's a category above his. And somehow had a faster lap than her. I don't know what went wrong there with that 930, but it's clearly some setup work back in the Mercury Garage for, uh, for her and Hanio and probably myself to do.